Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome to those of you who are on any of the campuses. Welcome to those of you who are watching this online. And man, I'm proud of you for braving the elements to get here, the cold, the snow, the, okay, man, exaggerate a little bit. Wasn't it just a week ago, I was bragging about Arizona's weather, and then look at this week, so don't brag about the weather, I guess, is the message. Hey, you might be wondering, what's up with all this all-in stuff? I mean, we just watched this video, and you got these shirts, and people are like, what's going on here? I will explain this in detail uh, as we go through this message, particularly towards the end of the message, but just kind of hang on. It, it, what it is, is it's an initiative we're beginning today uh, that uh, I, I believe is going to take us into the future. I believe it's going to change the direction of our church. I think it's going to make us a much better place. Um, but if I want to say this, if you're a guest with us today, or uh, you're, you're here, maybe a first-time person, uh, please understand something. Every now and then, in our ch- now and again in our church's story, we kind of gather everyone in the family room. And we say, hey, we, let's just talk. Let's talk as a family. This is kind of a series that's built around that idea. We, we're just going to talk. And we're going to talk about kind of who we are and, and what we're doing and where we're going and what matters. And so that, uh, that's what's happening. You're more than welcome uh, in our family room. And we're glad that you're here. Please know I'm not going to ask anything of you. Please, it's not targeting you, uh, but we're going to talk to the, the, the entire body about what does God want from us. And that just so yeah, heads up, that's what's coming. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about what we're going to talk about. I think we're going to have a great journey together. So <clears throat> another year begins. Now this, you go, what do you mean? It began like three weeks ago. Another year begins for me uh, because this is the first weekend that I've had the privilege of being in the pulpit because we've had guests. <laughs> Again, the power of one person's voice. Don't ever <laughs> underestimate it. Um, uh, but uh, the, this is the first time because we've had guests last couple of weeks, uh, Zach last week and then Sean the week before. And uh, so uh, there's some stuff I want to talk about. You, you probably think, oh, he's going to talk about New Year's resolutions. Oh, no, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. But I do want to ask you, how many have already broken your resolutions? Raise your hand. Be honest. God is in the house. He's, well, thank you for that honesty. He, he, he appreciates it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about New Year's resolutions. Those are important and necessary and, and good. I want to talk to you about New Year's reflections. Reflections, where I want to cause you to think about your life. I want to cause you to think about your future. I want you to think about eternity. I want you to think about stuff. Uh, so this is kind of the direction we're going to head. And I want to begin this message by reading two verses that I think are very sobering, very challenging. Uh, if you understand what's being said, then you kind of go, hmm, okay. The first comes from the book of Haggai, was an Old Testament prophet. Haggai said this. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. It starts by God saying, hey, I want you to think, stop doing and start thinking about what you're doing. Uh, do you ever feel like you're just getting nowhere? Do you ever feel like you're just spinning your wheels? Like, you know, the, I, I'm working so hard. Could, could it be possible that what God wants you to do is stop and reflect and get a deeper, a, more, kind of a different perspective on what it is you're doing? Here's the second verse, okay? It comes from the Psalm, Psalm 26, 2. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Man, I'll tell you what, that's a challenge when you say to God, God, I want you to give me a good going over. I don't know if you like going to the doctor and getting that physical where they go and they figure out, you know, hey, you got a problem here. This is like a soul search. This is like a a deep dive into who you are. He says, uh, God, search me and let's talk about what you find. So these are deeply reflective kind of passages, all right? Because I want you to reflect deeply. Now, I want to tell you the tale of two men. I'm going to tell you, these are two guys that lived, they lived in the 1700s. These were real people, okay? Uh, This is not fiction, it's not drama, it's real life. The first is a guy named Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards was a preacher uh, in the 1700s. He he was one of the most famous preachers. To this day, he's one of the most famous preachers. He preached sermons that people still talk about today. He he, he was an incredibly important man. A couple things I want to tell you about him. Uh, He attended Yale at age 13, he later became the president of Princeton. Okay, so this is, you know, this is remarkable. In uh, 1727, he married his wife, Sarah, and uh, between the two of them, they had 11 children. Now, what was remarkable about Jonathan Edwards is that he would come home from work 
Uh, at the end of the day, he would spend an hour, at least an hour, conversing with his wife and his children. And then when he put them to bed, he would pray a blessing over each of them. And the question I want you to think about is what difference would that make? Well, here's what's happened. As the years have gone by, people have studied the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. In other words, those 11 kids and their kids and their kids' kids. And this is what they've discovered. Uh, the legacy of Jonathan Edwards. Okay, are you ready for this? <clears throat> there is, uh, his legacy includes one U.S. vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. Now, some of those who repeat, you know, a mayor could have become a governor and, you know, whatever. Uh, but that is remarkable when you just study the history. That's one man I want to tell you about. The other guy I want to tell you about is a guy named Max Jukes. Now, Max Jukes lived in New York, and Max Jukes was incarcerated as a prisoner. And he came to fame when um, some studies were done. Now, listen carefully. They studied 42 other life sentence prisoners uh, throughout history, and they tried to figure out the ancestry, and all of those guys were in the lineage of Max Jukes. Did you understand that? And so they, they figured out, okay, what, what did his kids become? This is what they discovered. Are you ready? Um, seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicts, 310 paupers, and 440 who were physically wrecked by addiction to alcohol. Of the 1,200 descendants that were studied, 300 of them died prematurely. So if you put two trees up, it would look like this. This is Jonathan Edwards, and this is Max Jukes. <clears throat> now, before age 30, Jonathan Edwards wrote something that became kind of the guiding compass of his life. Let me read to you what he wrote. He said, I frequently hear persons in old age say how they would live if they were to live their lives over again. Resolved. Therefore, because of that, resolved, that I will live just so as I can think I shall wish I had done, supposing I live a long life to old age. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the end of my life and I'm gonna live the way I wish I would have lived, but I'm gonna do it uh, proactively. And you kind of saw the rest of that. Okay, so I wanna tell you about something. This is a little bit shocking, so kind of brace yourself. There was recently a cohort of some leading physicians um, from literally around the world, decorated, you know, very famous physicians that got together for the sole purpose of studying kind of the course of humanity, all right, from a physician's point of view. And as they studied this, uh, man, they, it's the most comprehensive study on the longevity of humanity has ever been done. And they just recently released their findings. And I wanna share with you, because I have those findings. They discovered something that I think, again, will shock you when you hear it, wait for it. They discovered that all of us are terminal. If you're confused, we're all destined to die. That's right. A hundred percent of us, you, you are destined to die. And uh, there's only a couple ways this is going to happen, okay? Now, one way would be that Jesus Christ returns and you, you didn't experience a physical death because he re returned before you physically died. But it, it might be that that doesn't happen and there's, if that doesn't happen, if God doesn't come in and take you, there's two other ways you're going to die. There's only two ways you're going to die, okay? One, you're going to die suddenly and like totally uh, un unannounced. You're going to die suddenly, which means you're going to die tragically, which means you're going to get hit by a bus. Sorry. <laughs> Have a great Sunday. Be careful on the way home. <laughs> you're going to die suddenly and unprepared because uh, you didn't know it was coming. Or you're going to die slowly and methodically. That's it. Suddenly and unprepared, uh, unannounced, or slowly and methodically. Now, if you die suddenly and unannounced, there's no time. 
you got no time to fix anything. got no time to redo decisions. got no time to clean anything up. You're just, it's over. If you die slowly and methodically, you're going to have some time to reflect on your life. There's still time to make some course corrections. There's still time to change the future. There's time to figure out, I don't want to be that person. I, I, you know, and you can do that. And, but, but when you get to the end of your life, if you don't die suddenly and unannounced, but slowly and methodically, when you get to the end of your life, like Jonathan Edwards, and you look back, well, what are you going to see? Are you going to be filled with regret and remorse that I wish I would have, I should have, why didn't I? Or are you just going to be content and fulfilled? Well, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. What are you going to see? Um, I, I, I want to bring you in on a little pastoral uh, insight. Uh, pastors do a lot of funerals. I don't know if you know that. We, we are around people uh, who experience death in their families. And, and I got to tell you something, um, and listen very carefully, because I want you to understand this. I don't like going to funerals. I don't like being at funerals. Is anybody? I mean, like, whoo, my favorite. Who died this week? You know? I don't like going to funerals. I don't like doing funerals. But I got to be honest with you, and this, I hope this doesn't sound morbid. There's one part of funerals I absolutely love. And, and I want to tell you what it is. Not the death, not the pain, none of that. The one thing I love about funerals is it's the only time, generally speaking, you can get people in a room to talk about the inevitable in their life. It's the only time. We, because we have this person lying here and everybody knows that uh, that's what happens, but it always happens to somebody else. Except when you're at a funeral, uh, we can start talking about what's going to happen to you. We live in a culture that never wants to think about death. We never want to think about what's coming. We never want to think about what's next. At a funeral, you're just kind of stuck there, right? And, and uh, it's the one time I feel like you can say to people, hey, why don't you pause, like I'm doing right now in this message, and think. And that's the one thing about it. So kind of paralleling that, that's what we're doing here. I don't think you should wait to the end of your life to figure out how it went. I think you should think ahead. And that's kind of who I am. I'm a planner. I'm a plotter. I'm a let's figure it out and how to get there. I don't want to get to the end and have regret and remorse. I don't want you to get to the end and have regret and remorse. But I can tell you this, because I've done so many funerals over the years, I want to tell you two things are going to happen at your funeral. I haven't been there yet, because you haven't been there yet. But if I'm there, there's two things are going to happen. One is there's going to be eulogies given, right? You know what a eulogy is? That's where whoever organized the funeral is going to try to get as many of your friends and family to have the courage to get up and say something nice about you. Let me give you an insider's tip. Sometimes that's a lot harder to find than you think it is. Because sometimes people go, I, you know, uh, oof, oof. Uh, yeah, I really got nothing. Because uh, you make something up for the sake of the deceased, you know. Uh, it's a hard thing sometimes. But, uh, and truth be known, a lot of people, okay, insider's tip, a lot of people exaggerate. They just exaggerate. They make you sound so much better than everyone else knew you really were. Okay, think about it. It's time. Think about it. But there's going to be eulogies. Now, for a lot of people, there's going to be no issue. There are all kinds of positive people who are going to say all kinds of positive things, all right? And it's going to be all true. The second thing that's going to happen, and it's not always going to happen the way it sometimes happens, but there's going to be an epitaph, okay? And an epitaph is what you often see written on a tombstone, a, a gravestone. Now, not always, but an epitaph is that thing that kind of, what did your life stand for? What, what is it that you want to be remembered? And, and these epitaphs can go from the comical, like, let me show you, a, a, I think this is a comical epitaph. This is from Mel Blanc. Uh, Mel Blanc is the voice of Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig and all of that. Uh, on his uh, tomb, it says, that's all, folks. Because that's how they always ended the cartoons. That's all, folks. Now, the truth of the matter is not all, but that kind of sums up his life. That's all. He spent his life doing caricatures of voices. Now, let me show you another epitaph. From the comical to the profound. This is from Martin Luther King Jr. We talked about him last week. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <sighs> Summed up his life. So what's going to end up? What's going to be in your eulogy? What are they going to say about you? What are they going to write about you? How are you going to be remembered? Now, it depends how you live your life. Now, I want to say this to you. If you spend your life worrying about your eulogy and your epitaph, you're missing the point of life. 
because there's something far more important about you than your eulogy and your epitaph. What's far more important about you is your legacy. Your legacy. Your legacy is uh, the most important thing that's ever going to be written about you. So let me, you, let me go legacy. What is a legacy? Let me explain a legacy. Let me give you, I'm going to give you three uh, like statements that I think kind of if you put them together, you get it. Okay, here they are. Number one, a legacy is what you leave behind for the benefit of others. It's not about you. It's about them. It's what you did for them. It's how you remembered in their eyes, the contribution you made to their life. A legacy is what you leave behind for the benefit of others. Second line, your legacy is the difference your life made to those who come after you. The, your life... Your life bless their life, and your legacy is the blessing you left in them. Here's a third one, all right? Listen carefully. This is important. Your legacy is not written when you die. It is written every day you live. When you die, it is saved. What does that mean? It means like it's an open document. You're writing your legacy right now. The minute you die, God hits the save button and the end of the document is reached. That's going to be your legacy. It's not going to change. You're not going to modify. You're writing it right now. You're not, they're not going to write it 100 years from now. You're writing it right now. They're going to realize it over the years to come, but you're going to write it. All right? So let me do this. I want to show you uh, and uh, kind of explain to you in the Bible what a legacy looks like. And, and to do this, what I want to do is I want to use a character in the Bible. I'm going to use uh, Abraham. Now, Abraham, uh, uh, Abraham is an incredibly important person. Uh, you might have go, I've heard of him, but I don't know much about him. Now, I'm going to use him in each of the messages in this series, just an aspect of his life. I'm not going to tell you everything there is to know, and I'm not going to tell you much that there is to know today, but I want to introduce him to you. I want you to get an idea who we're talking about. Okay, so we're going to talk about a guy named Abraham. Now, first thing i got to tell you is earlier in his life, he went by the name Abram. A B uh, R H A N, how do you say it? Abram, A B R A M. And then we changed to Abraham, all right? So, Abram, sometimes you're going to see him named Abram. It's just earlier in the story, Abraham will be later in the story. Okay, that's the first thing I want to tell you. The second thing I need you to understand is one of the most influential, most important people that have ever lived on the planet, whether you know that or not, whether you understand that or not. Abraham is a hugely important figure. In fact, three major world religions trace their roots back to him. Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity. He's hugely important. He's known as a patriarch. He's known as a father. He's known as the father of the Jewish nation. All right? He's incredibly, incredibly important. And uh, what I need you to understand about him, and this is the big point, it is through his lineage that you come and you find the king we know as King David. The absolute supreme king of Israel came through the lineage of Abraham. Through the lineage of Abraham, through David, came Jesus Christ. And here's what you need to understand. If you've been blessed by Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, Abraham is very important to your story. Your story isn't complete without his story. You need to pay attention so you understand him. So we're going to first meet Abram. He's actually for kind of introducing Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 11. We're going to pick it up in chapter 12. Uh, let me just say, I didn't tell you to turn there. So you can turn to chapter 15, which will be the next place I'll be at in just a moment. I'll bring chapter 12 up on the screen. Let me show you, introduce to this guy. I think we'll take this in more detail as, a, as the weeks come. But here's what it says, all right? In Genesis 12, 1. <clears throat> the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Wow! I mean, you imagine the best you could ever do with your life. You can't come close to that. God sits this guy down and says, hey, listen, this is what's going to happen. Now, it's contingent upon him obeying and doing what God said and following and trusting and surrendering and all that. That's all contingent on that. But hey, here's what's going to happen in your life if you'll simply, if you, now, again, make sure you get it. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing to all the people on the planet. That's incredible. 
That is absolutely astounding. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take me at my word, Abram. You're going to have to take me at my word. You're going to have to follow where I lead you. Now, I want to show you something. And I, I think a lot of us don't get this. Abram was just told, all of that was just told to him. And do you know the one thing that probably stuck out in his head? You're going to become the father of a nation. You know what stuck out in his head? We would think of a nation. No, that way then. He, he, you're going to become a father. Because this is what you need to understand. When God makes his promise to him, he's 75 years old. He's got no kids. He, he's 70, his wife's 65 years old at the time this promise is. You're going to become a father. Are you kidding? I'm going to become a father? You're going to become a father. And uh, you can just, you got to understand, it's not that they hadn't tried. It's not that they hadn't wanted. But come on, there comes a, there comes a crossover point, yes? Let's kind of let that dream go, right? Kind of forget about it. Uh, well, God offers it to him, and uh, both paths, childbearing age, it's kind of ridiculous. Now, jump over to chapter 15. That's why I just asked you to, if you have a Bible. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 6. This promise is going to get restated. It's going to get intensified a little bit. Don't miss it, okay, because it's good. Uh, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. You don't have a Bible. Listen carefully, okay? After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, oh, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram's getting older, man. He's getting older. He was promised it at 75. At 80, it didn't happen. At 85, it didn't happen. At 90, it didn't happen. At 95, it didn't happen. And finally, he's just saying, God, you know, I want to believe. I want to trust you. But this, you know, it comes a point. And uh, you know what's going to happen is this guy, my servant, Eleazar, he's going to get everything. And um, God goes, no, no, no. No, no. Look up. Look up. And count the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. That seems kind of silly, doesn't it? But there's a verse there that I think is crucially important. So I'm going to bring it up just so you can stare at it. It's the last verse I just read. It's Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Okay, no, hang on, hang on. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look up here. Spoiler alert. They have a baby. They have a baby. He's 99, she's 90. They have a baby. For the first time in their lives, they're going to Babies R Us. They're fixing up a nursery, painting it pink. I don't know. No, it'd be blue. They're celebrating. This is incredible. They have a baby. And, and you, you just go, wait, wait, wait. What are you talking about? Now, here's what you need to understand. Listen, this is important. This is important. They have a baby named Isaac, and Isaac is going to have a baby, and they're going to, and, 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 and through and through and through and through and through, and then we get to King David, and then he's going to have a baby, and, he's, and then we're going to get, and this is why genealogies matter in the Bible, which is why it begins, Matthew begins with the genealogy here, because you've got to understand Jesus Christ was in the lineage of Abraham. And, and, and this baby that was born is going to be the great, 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 on and on and on, great grandfather of Jesus Christ. So you start to understand, wow, this kind of matters. Um, which means, listen, listen, if you have in any way been blessed by Jesus Christ, and a lot of us would go, oh, heavens, yes, you need to thank Abraham. Because when he was an old man, God promised him something, and he believed it. And because he believed it, God made it happen. Now, let me jump into the book of Romans. Let me kind of show you the legacy of what of what he's remembered for, Abraham, okay? So this will come up on the screen. This is Romans chapter four, verses uh, 18 to 25. Now, against all hope, so when people talk about Abram, against all hope, Abram 
in hope believed, and so he became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, listen carefully, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. You see, if you've been blessed in Jesus, the, uh, Paul just connected Abraham to Jesus, and you're on the other side of Jesus, which just puts you in the lineage. Now it's on you. The story is now in your life. Where's your life going? What's going to be written about your life? Yeah, your legacy kind of matters here because your lineage is incredible. What did, uh, what did Abraham leave behind? Now, I think Abraham would say, you know, what, you know what? what, if you don't get anything out of my life, get this. I think Abraham would say something like this, no matter how out there a promise of God sounds, if you live by faith, God will be found faithful. I think that's what Abraham would say. Hey, listen, I just want to tell you something, man. Listen, 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 learn this. No matter how out there, no matter how crazy it sounds, if God promised it, you need to just relax and trust God because God will be found faithful if you promised it. I think another thing he would say, he would say, let me tell you something I learned from my life. Okay, listen, belief precedes blessings. What does that mean? Oh, we want the blessing. Give me all the blessing. No, no, no. Abraham would go, you don't get the blessings until you first believe. The blessings come to those who can believe. And often you're asked to believe what sounds crazy, like a 100-year-old man's going to have a child with a 90-year-old wife. That's insane. Oh, well. Uh, what would have been written on Abraham's uh, tombstone? Uh, maybe, um, I don't know, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Well, let's get personal. Uh, let's get personal. We've been talking about Abraham in the Old Testament, you know, Jesus, and let's get you and me real personal. Uh, have you heard the expression, I'm sure you have, standing on the shoulders of giants? You, you heard that expression? What that has to do is, um, it has to do with a concept, and this is not improper English, and it's not a pejorative. Okay, you can check. Uh, believe me, I check. Uh, the image is always, and this is going to sound funny to your ears, of a dwarf on the shoulders of a giant. That's the image of that, that expression. It's the idea that no matter how small you are, whatever height you attain is because of who's underneath you, who came before you, on whose shoulders you stand. And the smallest of us can be great if we're standing on the shoulders of someone great before us. It's so easy to think that, hey, I... <laughs> I've created my life. Every good thing that's happened to me is because I've worked hard and I've deserved what I've been given. And here's the truth of the matter. That's probably got a lot of truth to it, but there's also people who paved the way for you, who went before you, who did things that you benefited from, who literally, had they not been there, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, having the success you're having. It's just humbling to have to admit that I'm standing on the shoulders of somebody before me. Now, Abram... Because of what Abram did, David became king. Because of what David did, Jesus became the king of kings. All the promises of Jesus, because Abraham was faithful. Wow. Uh, can, can I just say this? Because I come, Abraham, Isaac, David, Jesus, I'm over here. I'm over here. Can I just tell you something? This is from my heart. I mean this very sincerely. If you don't know me, I mean this very sincerely. Every good thing that has come to me in my life, I will credit to Jesus. And I'm not just saying that. Every good thing, the best decision I've ever made in my life was when I was a high school senior to accept Jesus Christ into my life. Because that decision changed every other decision that came after it. The best decision I ever made was to let Jesus into my heart. You know what that did? It caused me 
to look differently about a woman that I would spend my life with. And that led me to Lisa, who had also been on the other side of Jesus because she experienced the grace of Jesus, which caused us to get married. And then the career that I've chosen, the life I've lived, it's all because of Jesus. You see, the legacy of Jesus is what touches you most directly. You're, you're part of his, his legacy. We go, what do you mean his legacy? What did, what did Jesus leave behind? Oh, man, so much. He left salvation for you and forgiveness for you and grace for you and peace for you. Oh, man, blessings for you, heaven for you. But you know something else he left for you? Something you never probably even think about. Jesus Christ started one thing on this planet. He founded something. He began something. It's had 2,000 years of successful history, but he only started one thing. You know what it was? The church. No, no man ever started a church. Jesus started the church. The church was Jesus's idea. Uh, and there's so many great things that are out there that are kind of periphery to the church. I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful ministries and all kinds of wonderful people doing wonderful things. Jesus didn't start any of those. Jesus started the church. And, and can I just take Matthew 16 and paraphrase what it says? The church, as crazy as it sounds, the church is going to prevail. The purposes of the church will not be stunted. The church will accomplish what Jesus founded it to accomplish. Now, can I get real personal? When I say every good thing that has come into my life has come through Jesus, that's a true sentence. But can I tell you one, just one notch below that? In my life personally, this is me, not you. In my life personally, every, just about every good thing has happened in my life has come through this church. I've been on this church staff 37 years, folks. I've spent my life here. I appreciate that. But here's what I need you to understand. I've never wanted to leave. I've never wanted to go anywhere. This church, and I'm not talking about, and it's not essential, it's great and awesome. This just happens to be my story of my life in this church. Other people would say they're a church. That's awesome, okay? But here's what I need you to understand. This particular church in, in my life, this is where Lisa and I grew together. This, most of our life has been in this church. Most of our married life has been in this church. We raised our kids in this church. Our kids grew up in this church to love Jesus. They grew up to marry kids from this church that love Jesus. They, they have, we have grandkids. They have kids. Their grandkids are growing up to love Jesus. And I got to tell you, I just go, where would I be? Now listen carefully. Where would I be without Jesus? And frankly, where would I be? without this church. I, now, that's me. Again, that, I'm not putting that on you, but this church has changed my life. Now, let me explain something that I think is, is really, really important. Um, this church, I, I'm very biased. I admit that freely and, and boldly. I absolutely love this place. I think this is an incredible church. Not perfect, not the end-all church, not the best. You know, it's not, and I'm not, I'm not a sycophant of the church. I'm just telling you, I, I love this place. I love the ministry. I love what God's doing. I love what God's doing in your lives through this church. I love this church. But this church is here today, and I have all the blessings I have in my life because a handful of people back in 1959 had the idea of leaving something behind them, leaving a legacy for those who come later. And they started this church, and it's been handed down through the generations to us. And now it's our, it's our church. The question is, what are we leaving behind? Now, I, I'm going to share something because I'm going to try to explain this all in together. I'm just going to try to explain a simple illustration. This is the best I got. I've shared this recently, so if you've heard me say this, just forgive me. I just, I think about this all the time. You know those Clydesdale horses, those big old horses that, you know, the Budweiser horses? You know, they've tried to study, how much can one of those, those big, strong, mighty horses pull on their own? And this is, the, this is what they've come up with. They, uh, 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 Clydesdale can pull 8,000 pounds, four tons. One Clydesdale can pull four tons of weight, which then got them thinking, what could two pull? Well, the simple logic would be if one could pull eight, two could pull 16. That'd be obvious, right? They found that's the wrong answer. That's not what they found. They found that if one can pull eight, two can pull 2,400 pounds. 
Two can pull three times what one can pull? Yes. But you know what they found further? If these two horses, and this is going to sound goofy to your ears, if they know each other, which means they were trained together, they, they, you know, they're kindled together, that kind of thing, they, they're, they do life together, they can pull 3,200 pounds, 16 tons, four times what one can pull alone. Last week I asked you the question, I said, look, hey, um, how much of the capacity of your life are you tapping? Remember that question? I said, think about that. You gonna be okay dying with all this untapped potential? And then I asked the question, what's the potential of the church? What if we were all in it together to try to do church, not just to do church, but to do church, I don't know, on purpose, for the sake of those who are going to come after us, not just for our sake, but for those who are coming after our day. So all together, all in together is about becoming more intentional about how we do ministry, more effective in how we do ministry, more focused on meeting the needs of people and more committed to the cause that Jesus died for. What if we would all pull together? Well, I think a couple of things. When I think about this, I think I've got a couple of objectives over the next several weeks. Number one, I am going to call all of you to get in the game. Get some skin in the game. Here's the problem. So many of us just sit up in the stands and watch because we're reluctant to actually get on the field. This is a call to get on the field, get in the game. Here's the second thing I want to see happen. In, I want to see our heart for people expand, expand. More compassionate, more caring, more like uh, able and willing to meet the needs of people. And the third thing is I want to see us transformed into becoming more like Jesus Christ. So that's what All In is all about. That's what I want to challenge you to think about over the, over the weeks to come. Now, I'll give you more detail later, but I wanted to show you a video that I shot because I was trying to get a bunch of stuff in really, really quickly. Let me just sum up the All In idea in this video. Uh, just realize you're going to hear it. it's going to go fast. Please listen to the best of your ability. It's going to move. Watch this. I want to spend just a few moments and share with you some things that I think are really, really important for the future of our church. I want to ask you to think about how much you love Arizona. And frankly, I am crazy about Arizona. I, I love living here. Did you know that Phoenix was the 30th largest city in the nation 50 years ago? Did you know it's now the fifth largest city in the nation? It's over 5 million people. Barney came out with a study and they studied the least church cities in the nation. You know where Phoenix fell? Number nine. We have all these people and you go, well, there seems like there's churches everywhere. The truth is, is we're not getting the job done. In 1959, a group of a, literally 15 people, handful of people, decided that they wanted to form a church to make a difference, to make the Great Commission come alive to people right here in the East Valley, originally in the East Valley. God is bringing more and more people, and the thing that we can't afford to do as a church is sit here and just go, oh, well, good for us. We have to constantly be thinking as leaders, taking the Great Commission, how do we expand this into the future? Because I'm so glad that years ago, people of faith thought ahead. We are about to embark on a campaign, we're calling it All In Together. And we're, what we're doing is church, I, I wanna ask you to take seriously, making a difference for people who are gonna come after you, because now's the time to make the decision to impact the future. We wanna make sure, and you've heard about this if you've been in any of our services, we wanna make sure that every kid has an opportunity to experience camp, because we think camp is critically important in the journey of young people, so we do camp. And we want to do everything we do to underwrite the cost of camp so every kid has a possibility of going. We want to find ways to minister to kids with special needs. We want to find ways to come alongside parents and help them and literally attract more and more because they found a church that really knows how to make a difference. That's a priority with us, and we've been dreaming about that. And one of our campuses has children's buildings that have been... Well, they're modulars that have been here for 40 some years and they're in really bad shape and we need to rip them out and we need to build something we've been talking about for years and years and years. And that's a new Mesa Children's Building. So that's what we've been dreaming about. And in the All In Together campaign, we're going, let's get this thing done. The second thing, the second part of this that we've been talking and dreaming about is finding ways. How do we engage our community in, in greater ways than we have? We want to care about single moms like we've never cared about them. We want to care about foster kids like we've never cared about them care about the homeless, like we've never been able to care about them. You get the idea of what I'm talking about. These are pe real people, our cares ministry. They just cares to, 
for the hurting and, and, and those who are going through grief and difficult times in their lives. We want to make a huge impact. We want to make a difference because we want to engage, engage, engage the community. So we've been dreaming and we've been thinking about how do we create facilities that don't just serve the church, but also serve the community. And in Gilbert, what we wanna do is we wanna run a pilot program of how can we create a space, a community center, that has all kinds of reasons that people would show up. There'd be meeting rooms, perhaps a coffee shop, perhaps uh, a cafeteria, play center uh, for children, uh, sports stuff for different people who have different interests, basketball, volleyball, pickleball, that sort of stuff. And so we've been, we've been dreaming about that. The world is changing and how people do church is changing. And not only do we wanna use our facilities to serve the community, but we wanna expand the whole online deal. And so we've been dreaming about how to literally have a very significant, very impactful ministry to people who would only reach us via the internet. And as we've thought about this and we've dreamt, we've dreamt about this, we start realizing, you know, this is really doable. It's a vision of the future so that we can be prepared for what God's bringing as he continues to bring people to the valley. You don't need me to tell you this. What's holding us back? Why don't we just do that now? What's holding us back is, well, we have to have the resources to do that. You, you might not know this, but uh, in the next two years, if all things go as normal, y'all will give uh, th about $33 million for ministry. Over the next two years, you'll give about $33 million. It's what you do, all right? And, and thank you for that. Everything we've been able to do so far is because you've done that. But here's what we want to do over the next two years is we want to expand that. We, we want to ask you to consider, prayerfully consider helping us raise an additional 23 million. Because all the dreams I just talked about, as we put pen to paper, we've come to the conclusion it's going to take us it's going to cost us about 56 million. And there's a whole part, a bunch of parts in there as to what all that would cover. But but it's 23 million more than we currently think is going to come in. So we we, we just decided let's do this thing. Let's do this. Let's ask you to get involved and let's go. Let's go make this happen. This is our moment in time to make a difference in this day and in the days that are going to come. But here's what you got to do. You you got to step forward and you got to get in this thing with us. And uh, I, I want to ask you if you will just begin, and we're going to do this for the month of January and into February, that you would pray about how God could use you and your family to make a difference. Because the greatest thing that you'll ever leave behind is the investment you made for the future. And now's the day to make it. Hey, we're going to put in your hands uh, a booklet that explains all of this in much more detail. And uh, you can get that at the church. You can get that online, however you get your hands on it. Take time to look at it. Because I'll tell you what, whether we're prepared for it or not, the future is going to meet us. It's coming. Wouldn't it be better if we were prepared and we were thinking ahead and we were ready to welcome what God's going to bring us? We believe in this, but we can't do it alone. It's going to take your help. Will you join us all in together? Don't sit still. Move forward with us. Bless y'all. Okay, so that was a whole lot, uh, but here's what's going to happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, when you exit here in just a few moments, and this will happen on all of our campuses online, you'll need to uh, get this through the church, but we want to put a booklet in your hand. And basically what this booklet is, is going to explain everything I just tried to explain really quickly, give you more detail. And um, there is in here, uh, this is a journey that we want to go on as a church. And I, and I want to invite you to come with us, okay? So every week, um, there is a section for message notes, and then there's devotions throughout every day, five days a week. And I want to encourage you to do those devotions and, and bring this back every week, and it will be kind of the study guide. This will, this will be the course that we're on, and uh, I promise you if you'll do this, you'll be blessed. Now, the second thing is, you, people are going, how, how, how come you got a shirt? How did you get a shirt? We didn't get a shirt. How can we be all in together if only some of us get a shirt? So... So that we're all in together, um, we're going to hand you your own shirt as you exit. I can't make you wear the shirt. I can't make you get in the game. But I don't want you outside because we didn't think about including you. So you're going to get your own shirt, and uh, uh, I'd encourage you to wear it. And, and if, uh, you, if you wear it and you hear all in together, you see all in together, somebody asks you about it, gives you a chance to kind of explain what we're trying to do. Listen, the years are coming, and our days are running out. They just are. I want to close this message on a sad story. And I'm just going to ask you, indulge me, because it makes a very, I think, a powerful, powerful point. So if you'll just forgive me, I want to close with a sad story. It's a story of two boys. We'll call one boy Bob and the other boy Jack. They were elementary school, or junior high school, excuse me, students. And um, they went to the same school. They didn't really know each other well. They, they weren't really friends. But um, 
th they were different because Jack um, was already employed. Jack had a job at the local hardware store in town, and and Bob uh, was was so wanting. I, he he loved the idea of working, but but Jack had the privilege of having the only job that any junior high kid in that town had, and uh, he he wished he had it, but he didn't he didn't have it. And, but then he heard that Jack actually quit his job at the hardware store, and uh, he couldn't believe it. And so he raced down to the hardware store, found the owner. It's a small city, a small town, a small store. And he said, he said, he was so excited. He said, hey, I, I heard that Jack, that Jack quit. And I came down because I would love to fill his vacancy. And the store owner looked at him and he started laughing. And then he said something really sad. He said, son, I'm sorry to tell you, but Jack never left a vacancy. Now you got to stop and think about that sentence. What he was saying to Bob was Jack's life here never made any difference. We will not miss him. He will have made no difference. There's nothing to fill. He didn't do anything. He never helped us move forward. Why am I telling you that? My, my fear for the untapped capacity of the church is that many are not going to leave a vacancy. You had your moment. You had your chance. It was your time. It was your opportunity. But other things got in the way. I don't, I don't want us to die and look back and go, oh, wow. I don't want God to show us what we could have accomplished, the difference this church could have made if we would have only thought it through. I want to remind you of this thing. I said it earlier. Your legacy is the difference your life made to those who come after you. This is our moment to make a difference for the future because we can be the giants that others one day will stand on the shoulders of, just as I and you stand on the shoulders of those who came before. So here's the deal. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to close in prayer, and this will close all of our services on all of our campuses online. Go get yourself another cup of coffee as soon as we're done here. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being the church that you are. Can you even begin to imagine if we were all pulling in the same direction, the capacity of what we could accomplish? It's not hard to imagine. It's a dream we're tapping into. So let's pray. So God, thank you for our time. Thanks for this church. Thanks for the people who make it up. God, my prayer is that every one of us leaves a vacancy, that every single life here made a difference. And that in the days to come, God, that others will rise up and take the place that we had, but we had a place. We were on the field. We had a position. We had a role. It mattered what we did. And God, I just love the difference the church has made already, but I just believe it's the tip of the iceberg. It's the beginning of the story. It's so far from the conclusion. God, the greatest days are coming. May we be prepared and be ready to meet them. And we ask you to just put your, your hand of mercy on this church, on every life, and God, may we be the people you wanted us to be. And I pray this and ask this on our behalf, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.